All right, guys, so if you didn't do well in the test, I'm making this video. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. So uh, if you want to retake the test, you need to watch this video because this is the relearning piece. Um, normally when we're taking notes, I give you a minute to jot down stuff, but I mean, you can pause it if you need to or you can rewind, I believe. So I'm going to run through these notes pretty quick. Uh, it seems that we struggle with the perspective stuff and the case studies, which, you know, is most of the unit. So uh, I'm going to run through it. If you want to jot down your notes, you can. If you want to check through your notes, you can. But if you never took any notes, then you should be taking notes. Because if you're not taking any notes, I'm probably not going to let you retake the test. So, like, you'll have to show me the, your old notes or these notes to show me that you actually, you know, put forth an effort. So um, we ran through the different discussion of what psychology is about. But as far as the test goes, you need to know that it's the study of behavior and mental processes. And I believe on the test I put the mind, but it is the study of behavior and mental processes is what we're go what you should go for there. Okay. And we talked about it's about a whole bunch of stuff and everything kind of falls into the category of behavior and mental processes, but specifically those two things are what it's about. Okay. Um, this stuff was really, you just got it or you didn't. I mean, it's just factual information you have to remember. This guy, we talked about where did it start. Officially, it started with this guy, Wilhelm Wundt. He was the father of psychology, and he started the first lab in Germany in 1879. And what he did was he had people, um, like the very first experiments he did was essentially he'd just like have you hear something and push a button when you heard it, just to kind of measure reaction speed or perceptual speed, which is super basic, but it was the first time anybody had done some type of measuring of your perception. So it's, a, it's the first psychological studies done in the first psych lab by Wilhelm Wundt. He's the father of psychology. He also established introspection, which was on the test. Introspection is basically the idea that you're thinking about your thoughts. Uh, you're trying to analyze your own thoughts. So he would give you an, I, I, I don't know, whatever. I gave you guys a toy in class, or he'd give you a bottle of water and he basically just have you think aloud to break down the thought process. So if I held you a bottle of water in your hand, what are the things that would come to mind? You might say cold um, or you might say blue or clear or you might say refreshing. All of these are different elements of water and he wanted to analyze um, the different aspects that made up the thinking process. It's kind of a an, abstract concept to think about your think thinking. But as far as the test goes, introspection is the idea that you are trying to analyze and break down your thoughts. Okay. Then we played the mind meld. I don't remember how well you guys did on that. One of his students was uh, Edward Titchener. And Edward Titchener took his ideas and went further with them. And he established our first school of psychology, our first perspective, if you will, called structuralism. Now, you should be able to remember this because it's structure, structuralism. They want to break down the mind into its different structures. Now, there isn't a physical structure of the mind, but they wanted to break down the thinking process, like emotions, physical responses, thinking patterns. He wanted to break it down into the different elements of thinking. And he established this off of... Um, what's his name, Wundt's ideas, but he established the school of structuralism. Structuralism would be the school that uses introspection. I don't know if that was a question on your test or not, but that would be the school that uses introspection, if they ask, if I ask you that question. And he took it a little bit further, but I'm not going to ask you about that. Functionalism is the next school that comes along. I know I've asked you guys a couple of questions as far as who disagrees with whom. The functionalists disagree with structuralists. William James came along and based his ideas off of Darwin saying it's stupid to break this stuff down into its elements because that's pointless. What we really need to look at is the purpose of behavior. Okay, We need to know why are we behaving this way. We need to know the function of behavior. What function does this certain specific behavior uh, perform for us? You know, um, Darwin's was the idea that you have these physical traits you pass on and it helps you survive. His idea was that you have these behavioral traits. The example I used was uh, spiders, right? So I'm afraid of spiders. I run away from them. That's a behavior. I run away from them because I'm afraid. And I pass that trait on to my children. I pass that tra trait of being afraid of spiders on. So the behavior gets passed on, not just like the physical trait of being strong or the bird's beaks or anything like that. Okay. So functionalism focuses on the purpose of behavior, and they strongly disagreed with structuralists. They thought it was silly to break it down into structures, 
We need to focus on the function of behavior. Another perspective that also disagreed with structuralists were gestalt psychologists. And we don't really talk too much in depth about them. The whole idea with them is they focus on more so perspective. And they said you can't break it down into its different elements because the different elements put together are different than the different individual structures. And I know that sounded super vague. The example I usually come up with is like a car, right? If you break down a car into each, every individual nut and bolt and piece of steel, it's not the same thing as those, hey, those elements put together as a fully functioning car. Just doing some measuring? Okay. Okay. That's all right. It's okay. Dr. Wilman is uh, wandering around. I'm doing, making a recording for uh, the relearning. Uh, take an example. Take a look at this picture. It is a circle of circles. If I asked you to describe this, you'd probably say that is a circle of circles. But literally, it is just circles arranged in a certain way that make you perceive a circle. If I took one of those circles out of order, then uh, you wouldn't see a circle anymore. And it's not the same thing. If I just piled up all those circles in a different method, you could make a different shape with it. So the whole idea of Gestalt psychologists is they disagree with structuralists because they say if you break something down into its individual elements, it's completely different than when it's put together. And we looked at some of these pictures of these are all individual books and you put them together this way, it looks like a face. It's different than uh, what it is uh, when it's assembled. And he used a, a parent motion to kind of illustrate this point that, you know, we see changes in our environment and it causes us to see motion even when motion is not present. Like you can all see this guy huffing and puffing and you can see the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man walking down the street, but he's not really moving. That's just changing in, in the environment causing it. The next and the last of the like classic categories is the psychodynamic or psychoanalytic. You'll sometimes see it called both. And this is Freud's perspective. You're going to learn over the next year. When you see Freud, you immediately need to uh, assume we're talking about the subconscious. Freud focused on subconscious effects on behavior. So right now, what you're thinking in your mind, what you can access in your brain is your conscious. Freud believed we have a part of our brain that we cannot access, and that is your subconscious. It is below your conscious awareness. Uh, we're going to talk about subliminal messaging and subliminal effects, like things that you can't consciously focus on. Um, so Freud, and, and this is super vague, we don't have, really have a lot of context to talk about Freud, but he focused on like a lot of childhood incidents. Maybe you had a traumatic incident when you were a kid. Maybe you were sexually abused as a child. Freud said that for your mind to work, it needs to take those experiences and lock them away where you can't access them, right? But they do kind of show themselves in your behavior, according to Freud. You act certain ways because of these subconscious drives or memories. Uh, Freud said we all have certain subconscious drives we're not aware of that cause us to behave certain ways, okay? So if I asked you, and I don't know if I had it on the test, so I've got it right in front of me. Uh, I asked you to behave her, explain her behavior using the psychodynamic perspective. You'd say, well, the psychodynamic perspective focuses on the subconscious's effect on behavior. Perhaps she had a traumatic incident as a child that was pushed into her subconscious, which is affecting how she's behaving. Or perhaps there's a subconscious drive for approval. Or maybe she subconsciously feels inadequate, so she's behaving this way. Okay. So what you really have to do is talk about how the subconscious affects how we uh, act. And you analyze the subconscious by using what he called psychoanalysis, which is kind of a broader category of analysis. Um, it's the idea that you use uh, Rorschach tests, these things right here. There's my grumpy alien flipping off the camera. Uh, you do free association where you ask what's the first thing that comes to mind. You can talk about dream analysis. Like Freud said, these are all windows into the subconscious, which you know you can't really prove because it's, it's a subjective study. But uh, but that's what Freud and psychodynamic perspective is about. And those are the histor historical perspectives, okay? These are the more modern ones. The behavior, and I don't like to spend too much time on these, but you guys really didn't seem like you got the gist of them because, you know, the scores were terrible. So uh, I'm going to maybe spend just a little bit more time on each one, maybe even answer a question as far as, like, the test goes. So this says that psychology should focus on observable behavior. And I don't mean that, that might mislead you since it's the first bullet. What this perspective is about is conditioning, 
okay? It's about conditioning, which is learning associations. So my dog has a very shrill bark. His name is Ramus. He's a little yappy dog. Uh, he always barks at the doorbell, right? Uh, so now he has done that so many times that I have learned to associate doorbells with his bark. His bark gives me anxiety because it's a really high-pitched, shrill bark. So I hear the doorbell and hear his bark, hear the doorbell, hear his bark, until I've learned to associate them together. Until now, just doorbells give me anxiety. And it's true. That's a, that's a true story. Doorbells give me anxiety because I've associated with my dog. There's certain words. Ramus hears the word hear. He, he thinks we're saying, oh, someone's here. And he goes crazy. He starts barking like a madman, right? So when someone says, oh, who's here? I, I kind of tw twinge a little bit because I've learned to associate those things. Um, behavioral perspective also has to do with learning re uh, associations between your behavior and rewards and punishments. So for this one, I would say, well, uh, the girl who is moved here is behaving this way because she's learned that when she does these things, she gets rewarded. Maybe as a child, she acted this way secluded. She would always be quiet when she was upset, and her parents would reward her by giving her affection or giving her money. Um, or maybe she was punished. Maybe she would speak out and she'd get punished. So she learned to associate punishment with speaking out. The big thing with this perspective is associations. Okay, And I put this here, the observable behavior piece. I probably need to edit it because it might have confused some people. Is that they think psychodynamic is a bunch of BS. Because, you know, the fact that they're analyzing the mind and the subconscious, that's not something you can look at and observe. So they said, we shouldn't be focusing on things we can't actually objectively study. They said, but we can watch people learn these associations. And we can see the effects and measure the effects of these associations. So the idea here is that they need to focus on observable conditioning. Not your silly personality, because that's not something we can observe. Okay, And of course, we talked about all the different studies. Like when you teach your dog a trick, you're using conditioning. Whenever I teach my dog to sit, I say, sit. And then I push his butt on the floor and give him a treat. And I say, sit, and I push his butt on the floor and give him a treat. And he's starting to associate getting his butt on the floor with a treat. And starting to associate me saying the word sit with the action. To the point where he just sits, and he's happy to sit because he's going to get a treat. The next perspective, I call them the, the happy-go-lucky hippies of the psych world. These guys focus on the more positive aspects. And this is super vague. Again, I probably just need to rephrase that because you guys are just jotting down what I put on here and then just going back and saying, oh, well, free will. These people just more, they thought like, when we talk about Freud, we're going to talk about his stuff is a lot of really sexual sometimes and kind of negative. And the other behavioral people are saying, oh, you don't have a personality. It's all observable behavior and association. So these people are like, we want it to be more than that. We don't like the trend of psychology being kind of this, this super objective, negative science about sexual stuff. So they want it to be more positive. So they focused more on becoming a better version of yourself. That's really the humanistic perspective in a nutshell, is being a better version of yourself. Okay. They say that you act certain ways because you have an ideal self that you aspire to be, but it doesn't quite match up with the real self you see. Um, Carl Rogers focused on a certain type of therapy where he was showed unconditional positive regard, where no matter what you said, he, effect, he uh, responded positively to it. Um, another guy, Maslow. He focused on your needs. He says you can't be the best version of you until you've met these needs. And he has a hierarchy of needs we're going to go through much later in the year. It's a pyramid. Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs is what it's called. It's saying that you can't really focus on your needs for social belonging until your needs for physical uh, safety are met. Like, you know, if you're if you're not safe, you don't have a house, then you're not really focusing on getting friends. you got to get the house part first. got to get the food part first. Okay? So, the humanistic perspective, basically in a nutshell, is being a better version of yourself. So, if I said the humanistic perspective would focus on her behavior saying that, well, she's acting this way because uh, her real self and her ideal self aren't really matching, matching up. Or she hasn't met some needs that allow her to become a better version of herself. Okay. 
cognitive perspective is kind of a vague one because it's a massive category. This has to do, cognition is thinking. Like when you talk about cognition, it's thinking. So this is all of those cognitive processes. Thinking, problem solving, memory, language, intelligence. It's a huge unit. It's a big part of the AP test and we're going to have, you know, three or four weeks over it. Um, but the whole idea here is you could, you could go a lot of different ways. And you guys mostly focused in on memory. You said she acted this way because she has memories of, a, of her childhood or whatever. That's fine. Or you could say she has problems with problem solving. Uh, you know, she doesn't know how, she's not fitting in and she's never learned how to problem solve or she's not a very good problem solver. Or she has really bad thinking patterns. Typically, she always thinks very negatively. It's all thinking, okay? Piaget was a developmental psychologist. We'll, we'll focus on him later. Actually, the next unit's development. No, it's not. It's biology. Because look at here, biology. Biological perspective is all about, it's hard to describe biological without using the word biology, but it's all the physical causes of your behavior. So it could be that you're having issues with your brain. In the next unit, we're going to talk about all the different neurons and chemicals and neurotransmitters and parts of your brain and structures of your brain. But I mean, obviously, if you have something wrong with your brain, it's going to affect how you behave. I believe there was a question on the test that said someone has a stroke, which and it affects their behavior. Um, you know, a stroke is going to have a have cause problems with your brain physically. So it would be the biological perspective that would mostly uh, apply that perspective of behavior or the way you're acting after a stroke. Uh, Gazana gets one of my favorite studies ever. We'll talk about that next unit. Sociocultural. This has to do with norms. Like depending on where you grow up, different things are normal and acceptable. Uh, you see this person with this giant rock gauging their lip, and that's you know, like I said, that's just Tuesday for them. For us, that's really weird. Uh, it would be unacceptable if you showed up in school like that. I mean, kids would be going crazy, right? I mean, think about whenever you see someone with a service dog. You see a dog in school, and you go nuts just because it's not a, a norm. We accept it, but it's not a norm. Um, so the fact that this girl grew up in a different society, she moves to a new culture, she can't really accept it, or she doesn't really know how to behave within this culture. So that could affect how she acts. There's a few famous, infamous experiments. And then you get the biopsychosocial perspective, which are just a mixture of all of them. I don't think I put any questions on them on the test just because it's kind of vague. Like I said, it's just a mixture of all of them. So, uh, so there's that. Now, this was homework. You were supposed to do this for homework. I'm going to breeze through these really quick. Can clinical psychologists focus on mental disorders, like people who have uh, antisocial personality disorder or multiple personality disorder or... Uh, generalized anxiety disorder. If you have a mental disorder, you typically see a clinical psychologist. Counseling psychologists focus on day-to-day -day issues, like your day-to-day -day life. You don't have a disorder, but maybe you're struggling in your day-to-day -day life, like you're having troubles with your marriage or with your family. You go see a counselor. Developmental psychologists focus on how we develop through different stages of life, um, you know, physically develop or mentally develop. Educational focus in the school setting. Seventh period just ended. Human factor psychologists focus on, I get these mixed up, I get I.O. and human factors mixed up, so you might double check me, but human factor psychologists focus on human interaction with machinery in the workplace. They try to make machinery and equipment more user friendly, okay? Industrial organizational focus on human to human interaction. They try to make things work better. How can you relate to your coworkers and get along with your coworkers better? Personality psychologists focus on your personality. I don't know how other to how else to explain that. Psychometric psychologists like to measure different abilities. Social psychologists focus on different, like we said, cultural norms, how the society and the expectations of your culture affect how you behave. Experimental psychologists conduct experiments. That's another one that's kind of hard to pin down. Biological, they focus on the anatomy of your brain and the chemical causes of your behavior. Cognitive focus on thought thinking patterns and problem solving and your language abilities and your cognitive abilities. And then forensic psychologists focus on the law, applying psychology to the law. Positive, I still don't have a good definition of it. It's super vague, so don't worry about it. I'm never going to ask you about it, and I've never seen it on the AP test. Um, all right, so that is the uh, history and approaches section of this, like the history of all the different perspectives, okay? Now I'm going to run through the research methods. Again, you've got to watch all this if you want to 
have the opportunity to retake the test because they have they told us you know, there has to be a relearning present and this is my way of reteaching it to you okay um, so this is how you gather data when you want to learn things about behaviors and the mind we watched the Walmart video there's two types of research applied research is whenever you do it for a specific reason you want to learn to cure cancer you conduct studies that's applied research we said Dr. Mr. Freeze, he wanted to uh, do this research so he could cure his wife's disease, right? Or maybe you want to see why students behave a certain way in school. You want to apply it to your, your education, your class or something. Basic research is just knowledge for knowledge's sake. You just want to learn more about a thing. You want to learn more about the brain so you analyze a criminal's brain, right? You're not really planning on using that for a specific purpose. You just want to learn more about it. That's basic research. Case studies is a type of research method where you basically get a lot of detail on one person, on one event, on one situation. Like right now, you could look at the Afghanistan situation if you're aware. The United States military pulled out of Afghanistan and the Taliban took over and you look at what has happened in that, in that case. The people are panicking and they're jumping onto airplanes that are taking off and falling from thousands of feet off of American airplanes. This is a case study. You could analyze this and see uh, what happened and how are people behaving, right? Now, you can't apply it to everybody, uh, but that's what a case study... A case study, you don't really apply a case study as much as you just learn it to learn, use it to learn about a certain situation. We talked about Phineas Gage. He's the guy who had the pole blast through his brain, and he lived through it. He was fine, like he was talking about it. Um, but this goes to illustrate the disadvantages in that it can't be applied to everybody. If I had a four-foot steel rod pass through my brain, I'd be dead. I mean, also, a disadvantage is that you have to rely on witnesses a lot of the times. If you don't have primary footage or if you didn't observe it, then you, know, you just have to trust people, which is always a bad thing. Uh, but a good thing is you get lots of information, and it's good for unique situations like this with Afghanistan or with Phineas Gage. Um, correlations. Correlations basically show... I don't know why there's a second bell after seventh period. Correlations basically show relationships between two variables. Right, like there's a relationship between exercise and uh, body fat. Right, the more you exercise, the less body fat you have. That would be a negative correlation. I think some of you missed this. Positive correlations means that the variables go in the same direction. It doesn't just have to be up. They could both go down, and it would still be a positive correlation because it's essentially the same thing. Right, like let's look. Think of um, the example I keep using is studying and your your scores. The more you study, the better your grades are. That's two things going upward. The more you study, the better your grades, or the higher your grades. That's a positive correlation. But I could say that the same exact way if I said the less you study, the worse your grades. It's the exact same thing, right? I'm just switching the direction. So now they're both going down. But that's still a positive correlation because they have this, they're going the same way. If they go the opposite way, like I just said, the more you exercise, the less body fat you have. That would be a negative correlation. I could say the less you exercise, the more body fat you have. Same exact thing, negative correlation. A zero correlation would be things that have no effect on each other, like the amount of texting you do and your, I don't know, the amount of texting you do and um, broccoli you eat, right? Those two things have no effect on each other whatsoever. My examples in class would be um, washing your hair and hair softness, maybe, or hair softness and the amount of conditioner you use. Those would have a positive relationship. Um, studying and grades, that would also be a positive relationship. Although Fs, if I said studying and Fs, that would be a negative relationship because the more you study, the fewer Fs you have. more you study, fewer Fs going in the opposite direction. And then this one was silly. The more bathroom selfies you take and job offers would be a negative correlation. And then pickles and intelligence. I said that's a zero correlation. I put a scatter plot on your test. Whenever things are trending upward like this, that means as the x variable increases, the y variable also increases. That means it's a positive relationship. So if it trends upward like this, that means it's a positive correlation. If they're just all over the place and there's not really a trend, it's a zero correlation. 
If it starts to trend downward, that means as x goes up, y goes down. That means it's a negative correlation. And as they get more closely packed like this, it becomes stronger and stronger. You also get a number for this. If things are perfectly correlated, they would be a positive or negative one. Okay, it's like slope. It's like a slope. You know, if something is straight downward, it's a positive one or a negative one slope, right? That would have a negative, be a negative correlation. Every time this goes down, that one also goes down. Um, you can see some of the numbers here. Here's a perfect positive correlation. Literally, every time x increases, y also increases. Here's one though that every time x increases, y usually increases. So it's a little bit weaker. Right. Something to also keep in mind is just because it's negative does not mean it is a weaker correlation. When you're looking at which one is stronger, you need to look at the absolute value of which correlation or of the correlation you're looking at. So a negative nine would have a stronger correlation than a positive five. It's one that people often miss on the test. Uh, disadvantage is the most common one is it doesn't show causation. I gave my example of ice cream and violent crime. They are positively correlated. The more ice cream sales there are, the more violent crime there is. But we're not saying that one causes the other. Correlations never show causation. I believe there was a test question that said, we can confirm that this is positively correlated to that. What can we determine about causation? The answer is nothing, because correlations don't show causation. Advantages, I did find an advantage. I actually found one on accident, too. I was looking at a new textbook. And it said that the advantage is that you have a mathematical formula. Like you actually have a scientific mathematical formula to give you data. So, uh, yeah. We don't need to know that for this test, though, since I didn't tell you. Surveys, you guys know what surveys are. They are questionnaires to gather, gather information about different beliefs and opinions and things like that. Um, advantages, is it's easy, easy to get a large amount of information. All you got to do is just print them out and divvy them out. The bad things are is people lie on them all the time. We like to embellish or exaggerate our own circumstances. We like to victimize ourselves or we like to promote ourselves. So sometimes you don't really get an accurate representation. Uh, it's hard to get a representative sample. That just means that you, get, you only can test a small group. That group has to represent the population as a whole. Okay. Um, wondering... Okay, I think I just now realized I've goofed up a little bit. Hopefully you've been able to see these slides. Um, get this thing out of here. Get out of here, thing. Here we go. Uh, so you've probably just been looking at some of the slides, but that's okay. You can follow along. If you really need to, you could uh, follow along with the slide online. Um, anyway, surveys. So you have to get a representative sample. We talked about that. And also just bias. Sometimes the questions are leading. Uh, you know, you can read into questions or you can pose a question a certain way to get a, a certain answer. I could say, don't you, as opposed to do you, to try to get you to answer a certain way. Observations is just where you watch people and you don't interact with them. Okay, that was in that FRQ we put in there. If you're interacting with them or changing things, it's not an observation. Naturalistic observations are in their natural environment. Jane Goodall famously went and observed chimpanzees in their natural environment. Laboratory observations are where you bring them to a lab and do things there. We watched the little marshmallow study where they had the kids in a room. Hey! Hey, how's it going? Okay, all right, see ya. Um, that was my student teacher from last year. He popped in. Uh, laboratory studies. So this is where you bring people to you. You can have a lot more equipment. Sometimes it's hard to bring your equipment out into the wild, so you need to bring them to you. I mentioned sleep studies. You know, it's hard to do a sleep study at home because they don't have the equipment to monitor your brain activity, so they have to bring you to a lab. Uh, advantages, again, you get to see subjects in their natural environment, so you can kind of avoid the lying or the embellishment because you actually get to see what's going on, uh, which is what I just put right there. Uh, but also, you kind of get tired of watching. You know, if you're just watching someone for hours, you might miss things. Um, you might be looking for things specifically. You know, if you're, a, if, a, if you're an experimenter and you're trying to find something, you might be looking for it and see it where it doesn't exist. And also, people don't behave the same way when they know they're being observed. So if they know you're watching them, they might act differently. If you want to see someone in an environment where uh, someone's being abusive to them and that person knows they're being watched, they might not be abusive because they don't want to be seen as being abusive. 
Last one, the experimental method. And this is cause and effect. So anytime you see cause, you need to talk about the experiment. I'm pretty sure there's a test question that said, which of the following should we use to see if this causes that? It said cause, so you need to do an experiment. Okay. So we start off with a hypothesis. This is a, a statement. I think this is going to happen. I think that smoking causes you to crash your car. Okay, if that's your hypothesis. Uh, within this experiment, you're going to have variables. The independent variable is the thing that you think is causing the dependent variable. So I said in my hypothesis, I think smoking cigarettes causes car crashes. Smoking would be my independent variable. What it's causing would be my dependent variable. Okay, so if you need to find an independent variable, you really just need to go back to the hypothesis. If I said that uh, studying, I believe studying more will help, will improve your test score. That's my hypothesis. Studying more will improve your test score. What would be the independent variable? It would be studying. What would be the dependent variable? It's what we're measuring, so it would be your test score. Okay. It's also, we talked about how we do this experiment. You have to have two groups, right? You have to have a group that does the thing and a group to compare them to. So you have to have an experimental group, a group that gets the independent variable. And in my smoking experiment, it would be the group that smokes. In my school experiment, it would be the group that studies more. The control group is the ones that do not get it because you have to have someone to compare them against. So in my smoking experiment, it would be the group that doesn't smoke. In my school experiment, it would be the ones who don't study more or don't study at all or don't study very much. Um, Extraneous variables are the ones that are the variables that you have to try to eliminate. You really need group A and group B, your control and experimental group, to be the exact same except for the independent variable. Because if, if there's something different about the groups other than the studying, you could say, well, that's what caused the results, not your studying. So if I had group A study three hours and group B study 30 minutes, but I gave group A marshmallows and I gave group B uh, pickles, right? Then you could say, well, group B didn't do as good because they didn't get watermelon or watermelons. They didn't get <laughs> they didn't get marshmallows, right? So you had to keep the groups as similar as you possibly can within reason. Extraneous variables would be the pickles and the marshmallows, the extra variables you have to account for. Sometimes you have to use a placebo to keep the groups the same because the fact that you know which group you're in could affect how you behave. So let's go back to my smoking experiment. I said smoking a cigarette causes you to crash your car more often. Well, maybe it's not so much the smoking as much as like the act of smoking. So I need to give the other group, group B, the control group, a fake cigarette, a fake treatment here. Okay? You see this with pills all the time. They want to see if this pill uh, is effective in treating this disease or cancer or something. Right? They don't want you to know if you get the real pill because they don't want your attitude to affect how the, the study goes. Right? If you're a cancer patient and you say, oh, I'm going to the study uh, to see if I can get help with this pill. And they say, all right, well, you're getting the fake treatment. You're not getting the pill. It'd be pretty depressing. And it would affect how you behave for sure. So they need you to think you're getting the pill. So everyone thinks they're getting the pill. Right? So in a study, when you want to keep the groups the same, you need to use a placebo to make sure they don't know which group they're in. And this is a single blind study when you don't know which group you're in. When the experimenter knows but you don't, it's a single blind study. But as mentioned, if you know which group, if the experimenter knows which group you're in, and I think this was a test question, if the experimenter knows which group you're in, they could drop subtle clues or hints to let you know which group you're in. So you really need to use a double blind study where you don't know which group you're in, the person you're interacting with, leading the experiment, doesn't know which group you're in. The only people who know which group you're in are someone far away who are not directly involved in the experiment. They have this on record somewhere. Okay, That way you're not getting treated differently. And I mentioned the, the uh, Grey's Anatomy episode in class. And then you guys come up with your own experiment. I'm still working on grading those. The different statistics, and this is just straight up, you just got to remember it. You just got to remember it, okay? Let's breeze through these pretty quick. You got a category of descriptive statistics, 
And there's a subcategory of this, central tendency. So you got your average, which kind of gives you the center, right? Your average. The median, which is the middle number, the center number, when you line them up from top highest to smallest. And the mode, which is the most commonly used number, okay? Um, you also have measures of variability, how much they vary or how dispersed they are, spread out. This will be your range. Range would be the highest, the difference between your highest and lowest. You want to know if all these numbers are clustered close together or if they're spread out. So you want to know your range. Standard deviation is the really tricky one. And I don't think I asked you about it on the, this test, but I might ask you about it on a retake. Probably will. Uh, standard deviation tells you how close to the average are the numbers. I mentioned if I told you the scores on this test were an average of 50, that means nothing because every single student could have got a 50 or half the students could have got a 100 and half the students could have got a zero. So mean, the averages don't really tell you much without standard deviation. If I tell you there was a, the average on the test was 50% and there was a low la level of standard deviation, deviation, deviate means to go away from, okay? So if I said there's a low level of standard deviation and the average was 50%, what does that mean? That means that most of the scores were close to the average. Most of the scores did not deviate from the average. Okay. If I said the average was 75%, but there was a high level of standard deviation, that means that the scores were very far spread out. Right? Not a lot of people got 75%. Most people got 100 and most people got 60 or whatever. Okay. Um, and then there's an, these are all about the actual data you get from the experiment. Okay. You, you, we run an experiment, you get the average of what the results were, you get the range, you get how close the, and this is all from the actual experiment. Inferential data tells you, was your experiment meaningful? What can you infer from your data? Can you infer that smoking causes car crashes? And you don't need to know these term, these, the formulas, but you need to know the terms. Was your experiment statistically significant, meaning, did the smoking cause the crashes, or was it something else? Was it the food, like I said, the marshmallows and the, the pickles? If I ran that experiment and gave group A pickles and group B marshmallows, then you could say, nope, your results were not statistically significant. You can't say that the studying caused the, the better scores, because you might have just gotten lucky. It could have been those extraneous variables. I'm just going to skip this for now because I'm not going to make you calculate it, okay? I didn't ask you about that. I probably should have, but I didn't. I didn't put it on the review sheet either, so I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, last thing as far as this goes, I didn't ask much about this too, so this will probably show up on a, a uh, retake, is um, guidelines. You know, we've talked about all these real bad experiments where people are just mentally harmed or even physically harmed. Um, They've really come up with, the American Psychology Association has come up with guidelines to follow if you want to run an experiment. Um, you have to get your experiment approved by an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. You have to give informed consent, meaning that you have to give them enough information for them to know if they want to do this experiment. I mentioned the Stanley Milgram program experiment. They had like a three-sentence ad in the paper. It didn't tell them what was going to happen. You have to give confidentiality. If you give, if you run an experiment, you can't just publish your results with everybody's name and just kind of embarrass these people with their results. You have to keep it private. And also, if there's any type of misleading or deception, which some re experiments require, if you want to learn some things, you have to debrief afterwards and actually tell them what was going on. Okay. All right. That was quick and that was a lot, but I mean that was 30 minutes, 40 minutes of me just going through notes. So. Um, Hopefully this helped. Hopefully it clarified some things. If it doesn't, then I'm not going to do it anymore. So you'll have to let me know if this actually helps or not because I don't want to spend 45 minutes every unit doing this. So um, yeah, when you get done with this, let me know when you want to take the test. Show me the notes that you took this time or your notes from the first time. Um, good luck.